Well, thank you again, Mike, for joining us. Um, I pleasure. wanted to, uh, the students have a little bit of your background um, from reading the book and also um, in the syllabus. But one of the reasons I wanted to have you come, not only um, because I absolutely adore your writing, is also because you do a lot of, a lot of different kind of writing. Novels, but also comics, but also screenwriting. Um, am I missing something? Uh, very occasional radio plays, a little bit of game writing, short stories. Short stories, yeah. And I think The Girl With All the Gifts kind of started as a short story. It did, so, yes. Yeah, you've, you've really um, done it all. And you also have an interest, not an exclusive interest, but you have a, an interest in sort of apocalyptic narratives. Um, the Girl with All the Gifts being one example, and then the, cold, the Rampart trilogy, which you're just coming out with the third book now, is kind of in this post-apocalyptic um, universe. Um, yeah, so anyway, so. that's part of the reasons I wanted you to come and talk to the class. But first, if, you, if, you, if you're okay with just reading some of the book to us while we, and then we'll start with some questions. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, what, I, what I thought I'd do is read a little bit. Excellent. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Um, so, because I, I know the class was read, um, Go With All The Gifts. So this is a, this is a different take on a post-apocalyptic situation. Um, whereas in Girl With All The Gifts, we're just one generation uh, after the apocalypse. In the, in the Rampart trilogy, it's happened so long ago that nobody is entirely certain what's happened. They have stories. Uh, the stories don't all agree with each other. They have basically a sort of folkloric or mythic version of how our world um, ended and became their world. Uh, it's, a, it's a society where there is no literacy. Literacy has been deliberately suppressed. It's also a society uh, that co is coping with an extremely hostile biosphere. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, the, the, the sequence does is sort of explore the way that happened, our relationship to the world that we live in now and the world that Coley lives in uh, a few centuries down the line. <clears throat> but this isn't very early on in the first book. Everything that lives hates us, it sometimes seems, or at least they come after us like they hate us. Things we want to eat fight back hard as they can and oftentimes win. Things that want to eat us is thousands strong, so many of them that we only got names for the ones that live closest to us. And the trees got their own ways to hurt us, blunt or subtle, according to their several natures. There's shunned men too that live in the deep forest and catch and kill us when they can. Nobody knowed back then who they was, whether they was just the faceless that had been thrown out of their own villages, or if they had got a village of their own that was hid somewhere. But they were monstrous cruel and worse than any beast. Against these things, we have myth and rude, like every settlement of humankind, put up walls, hollowed out stake lines, set sentries, tried every way we could to pitch our own hate against the world's hate, giving back as good or bad as we got. We digged ourselves in and weathered it, but what else was there to do? Each season brought its own terrors down on us. In winter, the cold could freeze your fingers off if you weren't worried, and snow fell on top of snow, and so you couldn't make your way without web spreads or walkers. The snow was mostly just water set hard, but sometimes it had silver in it, and that was dangerous. If you drunk snow melt and you didn't sieve out the silver first, it could make you sick in your stomach. Old ones and babies could even die of it. In spring, the snow thawed, which was a mercy, but sometimes, maybe one time in four or five, it would be a choker spring, and you would get something else coming alongside the thaw. Of all our mortal threats, I was most mightily afraid of the choker seeds because they attacked so fast and were so hard to fight. If a choker, choker seed fell on your skin, you had only got a few seconds to dig it out again before the roots went in too deep. After that, there wasn't nothing anyone could do for you save to kill you right away before the seedling hollowed you out. In Mithenrood, our answer to that was to try to stop the seeds from falling in the first place. As soon as the warmer weather come, Rampart Fire, which in my day was Catherine Van Astin, would send out runners to check the choker trees for blossom. If they found any, she would strap on the fire thrower and walk the forest. Rampart Remember would plot her route and 10 strong spearmen would journey at her side while she burned out the blossoms before the trees could seed. 
for spearmen was to kill or fend off any beasts that might come, watching Catherine's back and her two sides while she played the fire thrower across the branches and seared the seeds inside their pods. Against the choker trees themselves, there wasn't any protecting that would avail, so Catherine and her spearmen only went out on days when the clouds were thick and heavy, and if the sun gun to show, they run as fast as they could for the clear ground. Summer was hardest, because most things was woke and walking there. Knife strikes flying straight down out of the sun so you couldn't see them coming, mole snakes out of the ground, rats and wild dogs and needles out of the forest. Anything that was big and come by its own self was given to Fur the nest to deal with. Fur was Rampart Arrow. She would take the creature down with one of her smart bolts, and if it was a drone that come, dropping down out of the sky and throwing out its scary warning, one of Fur's bolts would oftentimes do for that too. But she had only got just the three of them, which meant someone always had to go and bring the bolt back afterwards. We couldn't afford to lose none. If wild dogs or rats or knife strike swarms come, we had a different way, which was Rampart Knife. Loop Finestin had that name when I was younger. Then Mardu passed the test, and it was given to him when Loop died. When a swarm attacked, Rampart Knife would stand up on the fence or the lookout and carve the beasts into pieces as they come. Then we would cook and eat the meat, as long as there was no worms or melters in it. Wormed meat or melted meat we kept well clear of, for even if you digged out what you could see, there was always more that you couldn't. I gotta say, our fights against the rats was far between. Mostly it was hunters that saw a pack of ours crossing paths with a bunch of theirs in the deep woods and both going on their way, but watching each other out of sight with spears all up on our side and teeth and claws out on theirs. Lots of people wondered how the rats could come through the forest even in the warmest weather, for it was plain they didn't fear the sun. Then one time, Perluvenest, Rampart Remember, talked to the database about it. The database said the rats had got something inside them that sweated out onto their skin when the sun came out and kind of stopped the choker trees from closing tight on them, or choker seeds from breaking open on them and growing down into their bodies. I guess I don't need to tell you how wonderful a thing that would have been for us to be able to walk through the forest without fear. Trees was our biggest problem always, and the reason why we lived the way we did, the reason why there was a clear space inside the fence 50 strides wide that we burned with fire and sowed with salt. The reason why we never went out to hunt, except on days when there was rain or overcast, and why the dog days of summer meant dried meat if you was lucky, root mash and hardtack if you wasn't. The reason why we seen the world as being made up out of three parts, which was the village, the little strip between the fence and the stake line that we called the half outside, and everything else beyond. Choker trees growed fast and tall, and they growed in any ground. The only way to keep them back was to uproot or burn out every seed that fell. If a seed landed in the ground and no one's seen it, it would be three feet high by lock time and taller than a man come morning. I know it wasn't always like that. If you're going to tell a story about the world that was lost, you'll most likely start it with, in the old times when trees were slow as treacle. But our trees wasn't like that at all. Our trees was fast as a whip. If you come across one tree by itself, that didn't matter so much. You might get a whack, but you could pick yourself up from that. If you was out in the forest, though, and the clouds peeled off and the sun come through with no clearing close by, well, Dandrake help you. The trees would commence to lean in on you from every side, and pretty soon there'd be no room for you to move between them. Then they'd close in all the way and crush you dead. Rampart Remember had the knowing of this. But like all things he got out of the database, it was told partly in the old words that we couldn't figure no more. He said there was a time long ago when there wasn't hardly no trees at all. They had all died because the earth wouldn't nourish them, but nourish them or the rain wouldn't fall. So the men and women of that time made some trees of their own. Or, as it might be, they made the trees that was there already, changed their habits, made them grow faster for one thing, and made them take their nourishment in different ways so they could live even in places where the soil was thin, which by that time was most places. When the trees first took it on themselves to move, they wasn't hunting. They was just reaching for the sun, which was the most of their meat and drink. But as soon as they moved, creatures of all kinds got trapped between them and crushed. And the trees liked the taste of the dead beasts and the dead women and men. They relished the nourishment then dead things brought with them. There was already plants and flowers aplenty that had that craving, sundews and fly trappers and such. Now the trees got it too, 
and being changed so much already by the hand of humankind, they took it on their own selves to change them more. They got better at knowing where the beast was, better at trapping them and killing them and feeding on what was left. And by then, the learning that had unlocked the changes in the first place was lost, so it was not easy to stop what had been started. People had got to live with it, and they have lived with it ever since. When I heard these things for the first time, they made my head spin. It was hard to fathom that the men and women of the old times had such knowing and such power. They was lords of trees, is what they was. They could say grow, and they could say stop growing, and the trees would do as they was told, like you can make a dog do. It wasn't with words that they had done it, Rampart remember said. They'd done it with things called genetic triggers. Nobody in Myth and Rude knew what them things was, but most of us agreed they could have been put to less reckless use. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I'm so glad you decided to read that section because it, it kind of, uh, I'm going to start with a couple of questions and then throw it over to the students. But one of the things that um, is in Coley and also in The Girl with All the Gifts is this uh, dangerous nature. Uh, you know, these trees that can reach out and kill you and the cordyceps fungus that can infect you. Why do you think you, why is that a, an interest of yours? Why do you think that's been a recurring sort of uh, element, tension in your, in your books? I think it's because um, our relationship with the rest of the world, with the rest of the biosphere is something which um, seems to be dangerously and desperately um, out of whack at the moment, like, like crazily out of balance. Uh, and so it's something that um, I think about a lot. Um, we're, we're going through another mass extinction event at the moment. Uh, a staggeringly large percentage of the world's species, especially megafauna, you know, large mammals like ourselves, um, have become extinct within the, within the time of the historical record, which is a, like a tiny, tiny fraction of a moment in geological terms. You know, we're, we're, we're living through another great dying, like the, uh, the one that happened at the end of the Precambrian, or the one that killed off the dinosaurs. And that's a, that's a terrifying prospect. There's obviously a difference between what happens in Girl with All the Gifts and what happens in the Rampart books. In Girl with All the Gifts, it's a, it's a, a sort of, it's just a, um, a speciation event. You know, a new species of cordyceps arises naturally that can jump the species barrier and in fact does. It's something that happens not, not through any human agency. It's just uh, you know, in, the same, in, in much the same way that um, COVID-19 is. It's, it's something that happens in the natural world that changes our relationship to it. In the Rampart books, it's our own, um, our own actions that kind of feed back on us uh, in, in, in more than one way. It's partly you know, that kind of genetic engineering, uh, messing with the natural world to make it fit with our, um, our own agenda. And it's partly the inter interventions that we make to try and stave off climate collapse. So um, in Coley's world, there, there are all these, uh, these, these things that have been done. That silver, the silver that comes down out of the sky, that was cloud seeding to try to, um, to create a reflective layer high up in the ionosphere uh, to, to, to keep off some of the sun and, and uh, reverse global war warming. So they're living not just with, um, with the effects of human negligence, they're, they're living with the effects of uh, deliberate actions that were taken to try to, to, try to salvage the situation. And um, the trouble being that obviously there's no, there's no way of, of uh, having a dry run if, you, if you're gonna mess with um, the, the, the biosphere, you get one shot. And if you get it wrong, then you just have to live with it. Uh, there's a series called Snowpiercer on Netflix at the moment. Which oh yeah, is, about uh, the train, yeah. Which is playing with similar ideas. You know, they do reverse the global warming, but it goes too far. Uh, they have a new ice age. Uh, so I, I guess it's, um, it's a way for me to process um, ideas like that um, and to explore possibilities. And um, uh, talking about Girl with All the Gifts, uh, I, I want you to talk a little bit about Melody and how she came to you as sort of the, the germ of the idea. But it's interesting, we were talking on Wednesday about how Melanie's also a bridge to a new world. And you set it up so beautifully because she's so um, in love with this Greek you know, mythology and literature. And then she is the new person. She is the new human at the end of the book. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how Melanie came to you, how that became the book, 
and then how that became the film. Sure. Um, well, as, as, you, as you said earlier, there, there was a short story first. Um, I'd agreed to do a piece for an anthology. Um, uh, two, two writers um, uh, who, are, who I know and who are friends of mine, uh, they, they, they were in the habit. So it was uh, Tony, Tony Kellner and um, and Tony Kellner and the lady who did True Blood. The lady who did which one? True Blood. Oh, I'm not gonna remember. Oh. Yeah, my brain is right. <laughs> Does anyone remember? They, 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 yeah. They, 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 they did these themed anthologies every year. Uh, and the, the theme, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a clever hook. The theme was always something really banal and every day. Uh, so one year it was family holiday. Days, vacations. Another year it was home improvements, and the year that I said I would do a story for them, um, they um, the theme was school days. So the idea was to do a, a supernatural story or a dark fantasy story or horror with the theme of school days running through it. And I said I'd do it, and then I couldn't think of a single decent idea, uh, and it was the deadline was getting closer and closer, uh, and all I came up with was bad Harry Potter ripoffs. <laughs> And then I woke, up, I woke up one day with just the idea of Melanie in my head, not, not the story, just the character. Um, a, a young girl in a classroom writing the essay that you're obliged to write again and again in your school career, what, what I wanna be when I grow up. But because we can see, she doesn't know herself, but we can see that she's, you know, she's undead, she's a, a, a zombie, and therefore growing up is not ever gonna be an option for her. So that was the, that was the situation, the germ. Um, that became the story. And then the story became the novel. Ba basically, I was contracted to write a conspiracy thriller under the, the pen name of Adam Blake. And I desperately didn't want to do it. I really just well, I wanted to write Girl with All the Gifts. Um, but I had to get out of that contract first. I, I kept begging my publishers to sort of get, get me to, get, allow me to rewrite the contract. And then I had to go back to my agents because I'd switched agencies. Uh, so I, I had to say to my old agency, could you let me out of this contract under which you would get some money so I can write a book for some other people and you won't get a penny? And strangely, they were a little bit reluctant to, uh, to do that. Um, but finally, I managed to sort it out. Um, I wrote the book. And at the same time, I was working with an independent producer, Camille Gatin, uh, on, a, on a completely different project, uh, making an adaptation of a movie adaptation of somebody else's novel. And it fell apart under us. And, and she said, yeah, what, what can we do now? And I showed her the short story that I only just finished and said, we could do this. So I was writing the novel and the screenplay at the same time. And in all three of them, the story, the short story, the novel and the, and the movie, you have the same relationship at the core, which is the relationship between the young girl and her teacher. Um, and you also have the, um, the, 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 the girl's, Melanie's infatuation with story, the way she uses uh, stories, old stories, Greek myths, to interpret her own experience, which I think is something that we all do. We make sense of the world through stories. I, I wrote a, a very, very long-running comic, The Unwritten, which is about exactly that. Our stories tell us who we are as individuals. They tell us who we are as, as a society. They tell us who, who we are within a family. All families have their own narratives, their own myths, their own folklore. Um, it was a different story in each case. So in the short story, uh, Melanie has read the story of the Trojan War, and she thinks that, um, like, uh, like, like the, um, I'm, I'm losing, not losing the uh, the names of the characters. Um, Iphigenia, the, the daughter of Agamem Agamemnon, was sacrificed by her father in order to give the Greek fleet um, uh, fl fair winds to Troy. So Melanie comes up with the idea that that's why they're on, why the children are kept at the base. That they're being protected from their parents because their parents want to uh, want to sacrifice them. So she interprets her imprisonment as um, as a kind of salvation. And then, obviously, in um, in the novel, it's much more uh, about Pandora's box, about the myth of Pandora. And in the movie, we bring in uh, a lot of stuff about Odysseus as well. Um, so it's always Greek myth, but it's different Greek myths according to the, uh, what the narrative seems to need. Um, and I know that you, you know, in your real life, um, you, you care deeply about social justice issues, but I just wonder what, what, what this idea of justice, does this idea of justice play in your writing as well? Just how do you, how do you think about that in terms of your creative work? I think it does play through. I mean, I, I, I never, I never really set out, um, 
to explore specific issues or themes in a story, I usually start with a character or I start with a plot hook and I build the story around that. But I, th I firmly believe that anything you write um, becomes a kind of litmus test for who you are and what you believe. I think, I think your ideas and your attitudes come through no matter how superficial what you're writing, pardon me, might seem to be. Um, I think in the case of Girl with All the Gift, I mean, um, have you have you talked about philosophical zombies in the course at all? No, please talk about philosophical zombies. We've been talking a lot about tentacles, but not philosophical zombies. <laughs> well, your 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 almost um, namesake Robert Kirk came huh. up with this idea, the idea of the philosophical zombie. It was meant to be um, a way of disproving uh, materialist accounts, materialist explanations for consciousness. So what Robert Kirk said, and what a whole bunch of people afterwards have said, was imagine somebody who looks like, it looks exactly like a human being, functions exactly like a human being. Yeah, if you cut them open, you see exactly the same organs, the same neural networks and so on, um, but they don't have consciousness. They are, they are able to perfectly uh, mimic consciousness, but they don't have it. And the argument is, because you can theoretically imagine such a being, this proves that consciousness is something else besides the physicality. You know, there's no, there's no physical seat of consciousness. Consciousness is a, a fact, a, a datum of a completely different kind. And materialist explanations will always fall short of, um, of accounting for it, which I think is, I think is nonsense. Uh, I, I am a materialist. But, but, it, but it's, a, it's a fascinating idea for other reasons, because it seems to me that... Um, very often when when one people or when one when one nation when one when a government um, wants to um, oppress wants to treat another another group of people unfairly say it might it might be um, you know uh, the Roma traveler communities who are getting a, the, the short end of every stick in Britain at the moment being treated appallingly badly um, or um, Jews during the Holocaust, <clears throat> or, or whoever, um, Mexicans at the American border. When you want to um, to treat to treat these people badly, you try to conceptualize them as different. You try to conceptualize their consciousness as being different from yours. You deny them um, the basic uh, courtesy of human identity. You try you try to establish otherness. You establish otherness as a as a philosophical basis for um, for discrimination, um, and and I think those are those are ideas that sort of bubble under in go with all the gifts. You know, when 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 Caldwell says that me what Melanie is displaying is not consciousness, but exquisite mimicry of consciousness, she's precisely um, putting putting a a, a cordon sanitaire, a, a safe distance between herself and the children who she is, um, well, the children she's experimenting on and, and vivisect. So um, I, I'm gonna give, we have one student online, so I'm gonna give Ray. Ray, do you have a question for Mike? Are you, see, I, I can see your picture. Yeah, um, I did have a question. Um, you sort of mentioned at the beginning of the call that you are a practitioner of like different mediums of storytelling. I was particularly interested, like, how do you decide what format or medium to tell a story through? Because you mentioned also that you worked on the screenplay and book for The Girl with All the Gifts at the same time. So like, how do you decide what medium or format to tell a story? And like, um, like what are the sort of, like what is your sort of thought process when you get like a story idea? Like how do you differentiate, like I'm gonna write this for film or I'm gonna write this as a novel sort of? That's a really good question. I don't have a really good answer for it. Uh, I, 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 I firmly believe that um, any good story uh, can be told in any medium. Um, but it's also true that, you know, the medium is the message, as McLuhan said. Um, when you tell a story in a different medium, you tell it using a different toolkit. And it becomes, in some ways, it becomes a different story. And adapting stories from one medium to another is never a straightforward act of translation. It's always um, disassembly um, and then like reinvention, putting it together in a different form. Um, so with Girl with All the Gifts, which has existed in, in all these different forms, um, it's 
substantially, substantially the same story, but it, but it articulates in different ways. We, we made different sets of decisions because we were using those different those different media toolkits. Um, I guess I'm usually in a particular mind space when I start thinking about a story. If I'm, if I'm planning it as a novel, then I start, you, 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 there's always the core idea. But if I'm planning it as a novel, I start to put the meat on the bones. I start to sort of um, to, to draw out and elaborate the core idea in a different way than I would if I was doing a comic book. If I was doing a comic book, say, I'd be thinking in terms of, is it a limited series or an ongoing? If it's a limited series, what are the basic beats? Because comic, comic books are, um, are serialized stories and the, and the serialized episodes are quite small and they have a, a rigid size. So I'd be immediately thinking about that, um, that articulation, that structure. Whereas with a novel, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, the canvas. So you've got much more, much more freedom there. Um, so it's that, I think, that the, the, the original seed could be anything. It, it's completely eclectic, but then you choose to look at it from a particular angle. And it's almost a whim, which, which, which angle I come in from. In a way, it depends on um, what kind of freedom I've got in my schedule, who I'm actually discussing the original idea with. Um, so it, it, could, it could go in any way, in any one of many ways, or it could go in several uh, different ways at the same time as go with all the gifts. Sorry, that's a that's a pretty inadequate answer. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, how about somebody from in the room? Uh, yeah, Emil, go ahead. Oh. Uh, say your name for Mike. And, Sorry, yeah. my name is Emil. Hi. Um, hello. Uh, I was wondering what draws you to post-apocalyptic fiction in, in particular, and, and what do you think it allows you to examine about humanity and, and what it means to be human? I think, I think um, there's a lot of different, a lot of different answers to that uh, that are all true. One answer, which is, is kind of really weird, is I find apocalypse is comforting. Um, I think it was John Wyndham who came up with the idea of the cozy apocalypse. If you're living in a in a post-apocalyptic situation like like Cowley is uh, in in the Rampart books. An awful lot of the things that like make our lives complicated from day to day have just disappeared. You know, you don't have to worry about um, turning up your job or losing your job. You don't have to worry about making the rent. Um, it just comes down to basic survival. So there's a there's a sense in which um, post-apocalyptic fiction can present as a kind of a kind of holiday from the from the from the pressing concerns of the day to day. Um, I think more more um, more importantly maybe more profoundly. I mean, you, you talked about uh, exploring what it is to be human. I think that that's part of the draw. That's the, maybe, maybe the biggest part of the draw. If you, you, um, if you think about the, the way that we live in our day-to-day -day lives, an awful lot of our behaviors, an awful lot of the decisions that we make are mediated through the social roles that we're enacting and through the social frameworks that we live in. Um, our degrees of freedom are not that great at any given time. Um, we, we're, we're living in tram lines. What happens when those structures fall away? When the laws and the regulations and the expectations that kind of keep us, uh, keep us on the tram lines, what happens when they go? What's the basic kit? What does it mean to be human when the rule books are gone, uh, when, when the instruction manuals are gone? So it's a way of looking at what's essential to us versus what's accidental. Um, which I think is is it's a fascinating laboratory, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the best post-apocalyptic fiction really is not about um, what if; it's about what are we. Mike, could you could you let us what, what do you think are some of the classics in apocalyptic fiction that you really would put out there as things that we should read? Oh my God! Um, okay, well I'm going to start with one that doesn't do any of those things. <laughs> there's, a, there's a novel by Jasper Ford called Shades of Grey. Nothing to do with um, Fifty Shades of Grey or um, handcuffs and manacles and stuff. It's about a future where most people are colorblind and where social status is determined by how much of the color field you can actually see. You're, you're, you're given tests that, are, that uh, uh, allow you to discriminate or show that, show that you can discriminate between different, different shades and tones. 
and your position in society uh, is absolutely determined by how well you do in those tests, which is utterly ridiculous. You know, there's there's no there's no rational way that you can get from that world to that world, but Ford uses it wonderfully to to explore exactly that the ridiculousness and the arbitrariness of class and caste and status in society. It's a wonderful book. It's actually a it's a comedy, um, and for much of it, it's just hilariously funny. And then it gets it actually gets darker and darker as it goes, and it ends on a completely unexpected note that I think is is amazing. Um, I loved The Road, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, but only the novel. I hated the movie because I think in the novel um, you're, 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 having, you're seeing these things described. You're seeing this, this place that is incredibly bleak and incredibly hostile. But against that harshness and bleakness, you've got the, the, the beauty of McCarthy's prose. So you're constantly in suspension between the two, feet, the two things. There's a line very early on in that book that just makes me cry every time I read it. Um, whereas in the movie, you've just got the horror. Um, I loved Children of Men. Um, I love The Handmaid's Tale. Um, so many choices, really. It, 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 it's, it's a very, very good show. Uh, Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven is, is a great modern um, post-apocalyptic fable. Yeah, I think Station Eleven is one of the few that tries to deal with the role of art after the apocalypse, like what, and, and so many people just like push that aside, like it's not going to matter. But in fact, I think it d does matter quite a bit that people will try to rebuild an artistic sense. Um, another question? Absolutely. Yeah. Another question? <laughs> yeah. Just say your name real loud so you can hear. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Lauren, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the, the, scientific part of your world building process for the girl with all the gifts, especially because you chose a focus that actually exists in real life and if that made the process more challenging of doing research and incorporating this into your fictional world or just back in that process was Right. Um, so that, 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 that was a really interesting process because it happened relatively late, um, at a relatively late stage in the conception of the story. In the short story, I just said it was a virus. Uh, don't ask any questions. And it never sort of comes in apart from that. It's, it's, it's a MacGuffin. Um, once I started planning the novel and the movie, I realized that um, the character of Caroline Caldwell was going to be really important and the search uh, the search for a cure uh, for the pathogen was going to be a very a very big uh, component of the story and a, a very big sort of uh, part of, of Melanie's Melanie's experience in the story so I thought if it's going to if it's going to if it's going to deal with uh, the scientific um, investigation um, then there needed to be a believable, a credible scientific underpinning for it. So I, I just literally went shopping for a pathogen. Um, and I, I, was, I was reading up initially about, uh, about viral um, and bacterial uh, pathogens. And then uh, in the middle of that, I remembered having seen uh, Secret Life of Plants, the David Attenborough documentary. And there's, there's an incredible piece of footage in there of cordyceps, the fungus, um, infesting an ant. And then growing up out of the ants, out of the ants' uh, head, forming a sort of fruiting body, as of the top of the ants' head. <clears throat> so I tracked that down and watched it again, and I thought, yeah, that, that's actually that's exactly the nightmare that I want. Um, so, it, so it was that really. It was because of because of Corwell and because of that plot strand uh, about the cure that that I I felt like it needed to be there. The scientific sort of um, underpinning of it needed to be there, and that led me then to. Um, to research how, how do you take a brain as a skull, which is, uh, you know, if, if anything's going to get me on the FBI's um, you know, wanted list for my search history, it's probably going to be that. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a description of a, um, an autopsy, not an autopsy, a vivisection in the book, which is one of the hardest things I've ever had to write, but it is, that is actually how you would take a brain out of a skull, if you ever need to do it, <laughs> which God forbid. Uh, Thomas, yeah. Yeah, I have a. Uh, just, say your name. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm Thomas, and I'm I'm a biologist, and I was really impressed by a lot of the the scientific details and the girl with all the gifts. 
Um, but like one one detail that I was really like surprised and impressed by was that there was there was a Zeiss five ten microscope in the lab, like uh, and like that's a model number that we that we use like daily. It's like we have in our core facility. <laughs> so, so, so like to get to get to that level of detail, is this just all from your personal like online research? Or do you do you seek out experts in the field for to kind of figure out what equipment there would be or, and, and that kind of thing? It's all online. I, I wish I could say I did, I did more sort of um, first person research. Occasionally I do. Um, so I did a comic that was set in New, New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, and I, I, uh, that, that was one of the years when I went to America to do, um, to do, do commerce conventions. So I popped in to New Orleans and spent a week there. Um, and I got to, um, to interview emergency responders uh, about, about, uh, about the, their experience immediately after uh, Katrina. But that, that's, a, that's an outlier. Mostly I, I do it by just like cobbling together stuff from online sources. Um, I'm, not, I'm not one of the world's great researchers. Um, I, I, I pick up as much as I need for the story. Because it, it's, um, it's something that um, it presents itself quite urgently in a way, if you're writing genre fiction. Because if, you, if you're dealing with fantastic concepts, the real world underpinnings are part of what makes the suspension of disbelief possible for the audience. If you get basic stuff wrong, then people will smoke you out usually. But um, I, I, I do what's needed for the story and then, and then I stop, um, which is a, in some ways is a bit disgraceful. You know, you, there, are, there, are, there are writers out there like Alan Moore who, um, whose knowledge of uh, magic, real world magic, is encyclopedic, and when he writes about magic in a story, you know damn well that he's uh, that every sort of invocation is is something that, that really exists. Um, I'm a bit of a, a sort of uh, tinker in that respect. Sure, and and also I'm really curious. Did did you come across any labs that are actually researching cordyceps from a neuroscience perspective? Because as far as I'm aware, that's a pretty unexplored area, right? I, I, I don't know of any. I, one of, the, one of the, um, the fascinating things that I discovered when I was researching the book was um, cordyceps isn't unique. There are, there are literally thousands of these um, mind-jacking organisms out there. And it's not just fungi. It's, you know, but there are bacteria that do it. There are nematode worms that do it. Um, there are viral agents that do it. And some of them definitely do infest large mammals. Yeah, so the idea of jumping from an ant to a human, it, it seems ridiculous in a way, because that's that's such a such a huge disparity in neurological structures. But um, there are organisms like um, Toxoplasma gondii that, that yes. cause cause the disease Toxoplasmosis, and you know it mostly uh, infects uh, mice in order to get into cats. The so mice are the primary host, and then cats are the secondary host. And the way it gets from the mouse to the cat is it, it messes with the mouse's brain and makes it um, more prone to risky behavior. Whereas a, a, a sane, healthy mouse will, will never run across the center of the floor. It will follow the, um, the skirting boards. It will run around the edges of a room. Uh, a mouse with Toxoplasma gondii in its system will sprint out into the open and therefore is more likely to be eaten. They, they, they take stupid risks and they're actually attracted to the scent of cat urine. So they'll, they'll go to where cats are. And there's some evidence that human beings who have Toxoplasma gondii in their system make poor choices. They, 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 they have riskier behaviors. You're, you're, according to one study, this is controversial stuff, according to one study, you are more likely to be run down by a bus or a car if you have a Toxoplasma infection because you judge distance and velocity badly. So you step out in front of a car that you think is a safe distance away and it mows you down. So, yeah, the, 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 there are nature is out to get us, and I don't blame it. I think that's the theme. Do you, do you still have your irrational, or no, uh, your quite beautiful cat? Is that still a resident of your household? Tasha is dead. Tasha, Tasha oh. died um, Christ, Christmas 2019. I'm so sorry. Um, she, she was very old. She was, she was 19, and she died peacefully um, on my wife's lap. Oh. But no, no new cats with toxoplasmosis have taken their hair place. We, 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 are, we are so stupidly sentimental. We still have Tasha's uh, food bowl and water bowl on the floor in the kitchen. Um, empty. 
uh, we, we, we're still at the stage where we feel getting another cat would be a bit, um, a bit of a betrayal of her memory. Another question from Mike? Yeah, Jenny, and say your name real loud. Um, hi, I'm Jenny. Uh, I'm curious uh, how you make decisions for like character traits, like uh, gender, race, and like how intentional are those sort of choices in your writing? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? You're just talking to you, take your mask off for you, yeah. Hi, um, so I'm curious how you make choices regarding character traits, um, sort of like what gender your characters are, what race they are, and how intentional those choices are. Right, yeah. Um, well, as far as gender goes, um, th this, is, this is an interesting thing about the fact that I co-wrote with Lynn and Lou. If you look at my work before Girl with All the Gifts, most of my protagonists were men. And I think that was just because it came kind of logically and without much thought to me to write a male POV. Um, it was just easy and therefore it was, it was the, the lazy, the lazy option. And then almost every protagonist I've written since then has been female. Um, for a long while, when I did interviews about Girl, I did a lot of interviews in 2015, 16, when, after the movie came out. Um, people would ask me why, specifically about Caldwell, why is Caldwell um, female? Why did I make the, uh, the sort of evil scientist figure, the evil in, in scare quotes, uh, a woman? And, and I would sort of make up reasons. I'd say things like, well, you know, it, it's more the, the, the conflict between um, Caldwell and Justin O for Melanie is more interesting if they're both women. Um, but actually, the more I think about it, the, the more I think there doesn't have to be a reason. You know, um, I'm, I'm doing a project with Neil Gaiman at the moment, and one of Neil's um, uh, basic starting points is, why can't this character be a woman? If a, char if a character in a story is male, why can't this character be a woman? Um, you, don't, you don't need to have an explanation for it. Um, and if as, if as a man, if, if writing as a man, your default is to make the point of view character a man, you should probably push against that just because it's a default. Because you learn you 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 learn more, I think, about your about yourself if you push against your default choices than if you simply sort of um, let them throw on the knot every time. Um, as far as um, ethnicity goes, I felt when writing both the novel and the movie that the important thing was just to have um, diversity, to have representation, uh, uh, to have non-white characters in the mix. And I think in the movie we, we did a really, a really good job there with the cast. I mean, obviously Senya is, is absolutely brilliant as Melanie, but there was a, there, there was a, a good, a good mix, a good ethnic mix. Um, I, had a, I had an interesting conversation with an American academic about this, about the, 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 the difference, the, 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 uh, the swapping of ethnic identities between the novel and the movie. Um, and one of the things that this, this, this woman said was, uh, it was to, to Nana Reed View, she said, um, think about the optics. If you, if you had kept the original ethnicities in the movie, the last thing you see in the movie is a white girl locking a black woman in a cage, which is a, a fairly, a fairly hair raising um, prospect. It feels a lot more um, disturbing when you, when you see it. On the screen, um, I think. I think. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that, that's that's all I can say really on that subject. I, I try. I try not anymore to do what I did when I was younger and stupider, which was simply to write guys, to write white guys, because I'm a white guy. Um, to try to try and make sure that um, my stories reflect the the sort of polychromatic nature of the world. Mike, we had, uh, I'll just interject here, following on Jenny's great question, we had uh, a writer, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's relatively new, but he's kind of taken uh, the science fiction world by storm. His name is Fenderson Jigeli Clark, and he's actually a historian, wow. uh, but he's written a bunch of uh, books, novellas, where he kind of, he takes on some of the racist um, legacy of science fiction. So he, like, he takes on, um, what's his face? Oh, Lovecraft. Love, Lovecraft. I, I need my, I need coffee. He takes on Lovecraft, you know, who's a, who's a terrible white supremacist, and he just refashions it, sort of like Lovecraft Country on HBO or the Watchmen series where they're, you know, where they explicitly go after Tulsa 
as an opening to the Watchmen, which of course wasn't in the Watchmen, uh, the original comic book. Um, and I just wonder what you think of that, because um, there seems to be a, a really interesting trend, uh, interesting trend to try to reappropriate some of the familiar tropes of science fiction for a less white uh, uh, result. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Victor Laval uh, is doing the same thing. Yeah, he did uh, The Battle of the Black Tom, where he took one of Lovecraft's short stories, The Horror of Red Hook, and retold it from the point of view of a, 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 a black character, sort of wrapped up in the same, caught up in the same events, because he just didn't recognize Lovecraft's depiction of New York. And he wanted to, um, he wanted to kind of uh, interrogate it. It is a terrific short story. Um, I think it, it, you know, it's, it's an aspect of what I was trying to say when I talked about how most post-apocalyptic fiction, and I, and I guess all good genre fiction, not all good genre fiction, but a lot of good genre fiction, the best genre fiction is really an, a, 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 an exploration of the real world by a uh, kind of the friend zones effect, by, by, make, by alienating uh, the audience in, in some crucial way to pull out a strand and examine it. Uh, I think the, the HBO Watchmen series um, I'm going to come right out and say this, it knocks the original graphic novel and the Snyder movie into a cocked hat. It, it's, it's, it's a magnificent piece of work. It's a, it's a reinvention that actually, um, that actually surpasses the original, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, say your name and just, you can take your mask off just to for your question. Hi, so we can hear Hi you. I'm Grace. And Hi. I have a, like, a question about the relationship between Miss Justino and Melanie. And it's, it's just such a strong um, kind of like loving relationship between teacher and like student, and, but also like mother-child almost relationship. And I was kind of wondering, yeah. wondering where, where you kind of drew from that relationship, whether it's like because of teacher that you had that, uh, spun, like, that really um, like, I don't know, helped you along when you were a kid or if it was something from like your wife and daughter. Um, I'd love to hear more about that relationship and how you built that. There, there is actually something incredibly personal at the root of that, I think. Um, and you're absolutely right. I, I, I did try to write it as a quasi, quasi parental, quasi maternal relationship. Um, so yeah, when I was eight years old, um, I, I grew up in Liverpool, uh, which is, um, I, I guess maybe a little bit Detroity. It's it's a it's a um, like a, like a, a a city that used to be a huge manufacturing hub and a huge shipping hub in the case of Liverpool and now is is very much decayed. Um, it's lost a lot of its a lot of its wealth and a lot of its population. It's a little bit hollowed out. Um, and when I was eight years, as my, my my parents were constantly out of work. They they both worked in manufacturing and they were both constantly losing their jobs as factories closed throughout the sort of um, 40s, 50s, 60s. When I was eight years old, um, I caught a disease called, uh, called scabies, which is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an illness of poverty, basically. It's an illness that you, you, you only get it if you're living in, in sort of fairly, fairly slum conditions. It's, it's uh, uh, mites, mites that live in your skin and cause a, a terrifically powerful itch. You, you, you scratch yourself. You can actually scratch yourself down to the bone. It's like, it drives you berserk. Um, and my parents were, were sort of desperately ashamed that we had this, that there was a stigma attached to it. So I, I, I had a finger, this, this finger here, which, I'd, which I'd, uh, I'd, I'd scratched really, really badly. And I had it in a sling, in a finger sling, when I went to school. And the sling came off. And I, I, I was, my, my, my mom had told me, don't let anybody see, don't let anybody see. Um, um, my, my teacher was a lady named Miss Pimpson. She came to put the uh, to put the sling back on my finger, and she realised that uh, yeah, that's what it was. And uh, she was she was incredibly supportive and incredibly kind. And uh, I, th I think Miss Justin is Miss Pimpson in in a lot of ways. Um, that was definitely part of the genesis of the character. And you were also. I, I, Sorry. You also spent several years as a teacher. I did, yes, but I wasn't drawing on any of my, my teaching experience there. Yeah. I taught, I didn't teach at grade school level. I taught uh, post-16. I taught in a sixth form college for many years. And then I taught in what I guess would be called a community college, 
in the US um, for, for the last three or four years before I, I quit to, to write full time. But I, I, I guess um, what I wanted was, you know, Melanie is somebody who's grown up in uh, an incredibly kind of restricted environment. Her knowledge of the world, her experience of the world is virtually zero. And somebody who's been brought up like that is going to be hungry for experience and they're going to be hungry for contact. They're going to be hungry for love, for affection. And, you know, obviously the, the, there's a scene in the, um, in the movie where uh, Gemma Art, as Miss Justin, you know, gets to say, you know, uh, I think Park says she loves you. Um, Miss Justin says, yes, yeah, she loves me and I just couldn't get out of the way in time. Um, and, um, Miss Justin doesn't want to take on this responsibility. She's terrified of it. Um, but it happens. You know, the, the, the connection is sort of forged from Melanie's side and then from the child's side and then the adult has to try to, try to live up to that, which I think is a fascinating situation to explore. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Anybody? Yeah, Chase, go ahead. I, yeah, same name. Yeah, my, uh, my name is Chase. I kind of waited <laughs> till the end because I don't think it's a very good question. But <laughs> I was kind of just wondering how you felt about the ending that you wrote the book um, and sort of like how we're supposed to feel about it. Because I sort of had a really weird mix of, um, you know, kind of like upset because the human population was almost, you know, extinct. But then we also talked a lot about how this was sort of a new beginning for humanity um, and maybe like a potentially like a better beginning. Um, so like, did you know that that's how you were going to end the book? And how did you feel while doing that, while killing all of humanity? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I definitely knew that was how it had to end. Um, I, I, I think I think it's a happy ending. I, I, I think it's a positive ending and an, an optimistic ending. I think you know, given the, the starting circumstances, it's the most optimistic ending that you could possibly have for that story. Um, you know, a speciation, a speciation event and some kind of human race carrying on, even though um, um, most of our world has, has sort of vanished. Um, so it, it's 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 the story of it's, 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 a, it's a way of asking the question what comes after us because it, it seems to me that we're living in the last days the last the last years the last decades of this global civilization that we've built we've used up uh, mil literally millions of years of um of trapped carbon fuels in the space of a couple of centuries um we're destroying our environment making our environment um, inhospitable to our species. Um, and the damage that we're doing outpaces by a long way the efforts that we're making to change it. And it's easy to despair. It's easy to look at that situation in despair and just think, you know, these are the end times. But I don't think they are because I think one of the things the human species is, is incredibly tenacious and resourceful. And I think in some form we will survive. I think what's going to end is this, you know, the everything that the, the, the human civilization spans the entire surface of the globe and allows us to go from anywhere on the globe to any other part of the globe in the, in a, in the space of hours. Um, you know, it's only, it's what, two centuries since it would have taken like a month to get from Glasgow to London by horse. Um, maybe I exaggerate, maybe only two or three weeks, but you know, now, now you can do it in an airplane in 40 minutes. In some form, we're going to survive, but that that utility, that that that, that incredible um, freedom that we have now, it's incredible. Um, the, the 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 quality of life that we have is going to disappear, and I think it's interesting to look at what comes next, and you know, to to look at it honestly, but not um, not pessimistically, not despairingly. In some form, we will go on. It's only a question of what form. Um, so last question, um, totally unrelated. Uh, give us a sense of what it's like in London right now with the pandemic and have you gotten a shot of what's going on with the um, lockdown? Give us a sense of what it's like. Um, I have had my shot. I had my first shot on Tuesday and I had horrible side effects. I spent 24 hours shivering and shaking. Um, my wife, who got it at the same time, was fine. Uh, there's no justice. Um, it's it's been weird. Yeah, we 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 we've taken the lockdown very seriously, and most of the people we know in this neighborhood have. So um, 
we've lived with our two sons and we've seen nobody else really in in in, in the past uh is it 10 months? I guess it's 10 months, uh, nearly 11 so 12, months. 12 for us. It's this March is when everything fell apart. Remember, we went for spring break yeah. and everything fell apart. Yeah. March 20th was when lockdown started here. So, yeah, it's getting on, getting on for a year. Um, it's weird. Yeah, it throws you back on yourself. We've, we've, uh, we've taken having long walks every day. So one hour of every day is, uh, is a walk. We're lucky enough to have sort of quite a lot of parkland around here. Um, but it's yeah i, th I think um it makes you feel fragile i think it, it makes you lose your social skills to some extent so the things things that i used to take for granted now feel quite hard um i had some pitching sessions uh, last week where i was talking to maybe a sort of dozen producers on a, on a call like this which you know it's it's a standard part of uh of working life for a writer but it felt terrifying it's uh it's odd. It's really odd. I, I think I've become a hermit. And I think possibly when lockdown ends, I'll go and live in a desert somewhere, sitting on top of a column and meditating. <laughs> I'm just not good with human beings. <laughs> it, helps it helps that I can't see any of you. <laughs> Where there are no killer trees. <laughs> I, ideally, yeah, yeah. Hence desert, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere with a lot of open space, so if the trees do come to you, yeah. see them coming. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. Let's thank Mike. Um, thank you. When you can let us know what your next project is, please do. And I'll, I'll circulate the news. And I'm imagining you're not doing a world tour for uh, the fall of Kobe, but uh, if there's anything else that I can direct people to, if you're doing online events, let me know. I will definitely do that. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, everyone. Take care.